Folks, welcome back for the commercial break. I'm always excited to have this next guest on. We get a lot of truth. We get a lot of clarity. We get a lot of conviction. And I think in today's Washington environment where conviction seems to be the easiest thing to bend on, our next guest holds firm to the values he has. And I think it holds firm to the common sense expectations that Americans have, particularly after they put Republicans in control of the House this past election in 2022. Joining me right now, from the great state of Georgia, Congressman Austin Scott. Congressman, always great to have you on, sir. John, thanks for having us. I want to start with the news of the day. There'll be a vote, sounds as early as this afternoon, another CR to kick the can down the road a couple of months. I do think there's a two-tier track, though, setting up behind it. This isn't the end game, another CR. But the idea that we have now had to have two CRs, uh, two temporary spending bills, just to keep government open so that Republicans can get the job done they promised to get done, which is, 12 budget bills, cutting government. How frustrating is it? And what's the end game? Do you still have some optimism that before next year's election, Republicans can deliver on what they promised in 2022? Oh, yeah, I, I have uh, I have every expectation that we will that we will keep pushing ahead with the with the appropriation measures. Let me let me take you back just just a little uh, less than 12 months ago and just remind you that the Senate sent the House a piece of legislation that actually increased spending this past December. There were some Republicans that voted with all of the Democrats to do that in the Senate, and they did not include the debt limit in that. So they, they increased spending without the debt limit that it took to pay for it. And that kind of set up, if you will, John, the the challenges that, that we had uh, that ultimately led to a small group of Republicans uh, voting to remove Speaker McCarthy, and then Mike Johnson has now come in as the Speaker of the House, and he's only had a, a, a few days, honestly, as Speaker of the House, and he needs a little breathing room, room here. So, uh, you know, I'm going to vote for the continuing resolution and and hopefully give Speaker Johnson some breathing room uh, to finish getting these appropriation measures done. And unfortunately, he has gotten uh, no honeymoon whatsoever from, you know, the hardliners on the right. And, and what I would tell you is, uh, it, you know, we, we've, we've got an election coming up in 12 months uh, for Republicans out there that, that, are, that are watching what happened uh, just a couple of weeks ago. We did not do very well in the elections. Uh, we're going to have, uh, you know, certainly the, the Republican nominee will be selected over the next couple of months, and then we've got a presidential election ahead. And so our goal is to keep pushing forward, get the appropriation measures done, but shutdowns only help only help one group, and that is the incompetent group that's in charge of the White House right now and in charge of the Senate. And so uh, we're not all going to get everything we want, but we can get reasonable uh, budget measures passed and and keep this country moving forward. And then when we go to the polls in November, we just got to have the help from the American citizens. Um, you know, because the tax cuts that, that we passed under Donald Trump, they expire at the end of 25. And if we're not able to win the House and the Senate and the presidency, then every American out there is going to have higher taxes. Yeah. In an even more unstable world than we have now. I mean, the world has been so destabilized since Joe Biden took over. It just you look everywhere. You look into the Balkans, you see bad actions there, Armenia and Azerbaijan, China and Taiwan and China and other places nearby. It just seems as though another four years would have this world spiral out of control in way we, ways we can't imagine. And I think also watching the FBI director's warning the other day of just how dangerous a moment the country finds itself in with the open border and now the Israel-Hamas war. Tell us your take on what the FBI director has said and what the threat assessment is when you look at it yourself. Uh, I, think, I think he's being uh, just totally honest with the American citizens. We have no idea who has come in this country over the last several years. We have no idea what they have brought into this country over the last several years. And I think he's just giving an honest, honest assessment of, uh, of the threats that have come from the border. And, and then if you look at what's, what's happening, especially on our college campuses right now, John, the, you know, the anti-Semitism that's out, that, that is out there, the hatred for Israel and, and people of the Jewish faith that we've seen, uh, from, you know, the, these, on these college campuses, and and what Hamas did is one of the most barbaric things that I have I have ever um, 
seen the evidence of and, and how anybody could stand up and say uh, anything derogatory about Israel or people of the Jewish faith at, at, after what Hamas did, man, I would have thought that that was a simple thing to condemn terrorism, but apparently not anymore. And so, and so that approach, I think, that, that we've seen inside the United States and this activism uh, on the other side uh, is, is one of the concerns that, that we all should have with what's going on in the country. It's the perfect storm. And Joe Biden has been juicing the clouds in a lot of ways, uh, particularly with that open border. People just look and see. Well, like Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris is the one that he made the border czar. And then, you, you know, Secretary Mayorkas, you know, he, 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 he refuses to acknowledge the problems down there. And, and if you go down there, John, and you go through and you see the detention centers, people, people think that, you know, these are people that are coming from Mexico, and certainly some of them are. But I'm telling you, when you get down there and you see who's, who's actually in detention, I mean, they're coming from the Middle East. They're coming from China. They're coming from all over the world, uh, not not just the Western Hemisphere. No, that, that's the scary part. And they're coming in larger numbers by the day. It's just you look at the passports discarded at the border. We have reporters down there going, they're coming from the Middle East. They're coming from China and Russia. They're just dropping their passports and their IDs and sneaking into this country. It's pretty, pretty scary. You mentioned Mayorkas, and yesterday I think there was some frustration among the base. Oh, well, there was a chance to impeach him and they moved to an impeachment inquiry. They didn't. But actually, referring it to a committee may actually have an impact in the near future. It may actually accelerate the possibility of eventually getting to an impeachment. Talk about what happened yesterday, what your take is, and then also what the steps are to actually maybe get some accountability for the guy before the next election. Yes. Yeah, so look, I, I voted not the Senate committee. I, I voted to go ahead and let's go ahead and do this. Um, it, it is that there were several that voted. I, I say several. There were enough that voted to send it to committee that it went to committee. Um, you know, that this is a guy who has ignored his duty to protect the country. And and I normally I normally would have voted to send it, send it to committee. Because I think that's where that's where it should be done. We should have the hearings. We should uh, we should do it in, a, in an orderly process. But with this particular issue with the border and Mayorkas, it was just time to go ahead and and, and take care of this. And uh, I, I wish we had had the debate yesterday. I hope that we have the hearings in the committee, and I hope that um, I, I I just hope we can have an honest discussion about him totally ignoring the situation at the border and the threat that it's created for, for every American in this country. Not just every American. Look, the, the people who, who, who legally immigrated to this country as well. Yeah, that's, that's the thing that's really concerning. And when you talk to people that are in the law enforcement components of DHS, and I do talk to them all the time, they have a lot of concern. There's just no leadership. There's no strategy. There's no sharing of information. And I think people are really concerned that we've created the perfect storm for for something bad to happen. As you look out now, I think people look and say, there are a lot of boogeymen that Republicans ran against in 2022. We're going to crush the debt. We're going to punish the FBI for its FISA abuses. We're going to punish the Mayorkas for the open border. We're going to punish, punish Joe Biden. Now there is an impeachment inquiry, Joe Biden. So that got done. But I think the checklist of what people thought might happen when Republicans took over hasn't quite been filled out. How do you respond to that? And what's your expectation? How you fix it? Yeah, I think, look, I, th I think the pain of the economy is... Um, it, it has slowed a lot of things down. I, I, I just, just being honest with you, the pain of the economy has slowed a lot of things down. The tax receipts are uh, are significantly lower than expected, and that is because of uh, just what just what's happening in the economy. Uh, there, there are you know we we did not get the budget deals done that we wanted to get done. Um, now we we had a house. We have the House with a very slim margin. The Democrats have the Senate, and the Democrats have the White House. So I do think that maybe some of the expectations on on how much we could get in cuts were were probably uh, a little a little larger uh, than than what could have could have realistically gotten done. I think that some of our I think some of our people overpromised that on on things that we could deliver with a five seat margin. But the number one issue the number one issue. Um, 
number one and two, very close together, are our security and the economy. And people are very scared when when they're when they're when they're going to work and and their paycheck may be larger than it was, but their bank account is is lower than it's ever been because of what they're spending on fuel and food and the other basic necessities. They they know this economy is not working for them. And and when you look at the security situation with everything that has happened in Israel, uh, when you see the protests inside the United States, like we haven't seen uh, really probably since Vietnam, um, and and for a much different reason back then than we see them today, when you look at what's going on at the border, when you look uh, Israel, Ukraine, uh, what China is doing and how aggressive they've been, uh, there, there's a lot to be concerned about. And, and I'll tell you, the world benefits when the United States has strong leadership. And, you know, whether you like Donald Trump or not, he was a strong leader. And the world was, for the most part, at peace when he was president of the United States. And our economy was good when he was the president of the United States. And, you know, but for COVID, I think he'd be the president of the United States today. Uh, and, and you know, I think the world would be in a much better position. So we're going to have our nominee within, within the next couple of months. And uh, it's obviously, a, you know, a three-person race at this stage with President Trump in the lead. And then we will, uh, you know, we'll go to November, and we're going to have to make sure that the American citizens know that, that we feel the pain. We feel the pain at the pump. We feel the pain at the grocery store. We're going to do everything we can to get this economy back on track. We're going to do everything we can to protect, to protect the tax cuts that we put in place under Donald Trump. And we're going to do everything we can to make sure that we've got the strongest military that, uh, that, it, that is able and capable and willing to protect us. And, and we're going to have to make sure that the world understands that those who, those who love freedom around the world are going to have a friend in, in the United States and those who don't are going to have somebody they should fear in the United States. Yeah, I think that that's the key. There has to be that. That fear is a part, a component of uh, of respect on the world stage. And right now, it's really missing. A last question for you, because I think a lot, a lot of people looking at it in December, the Section 702 FISA authorities expire. I know you've played a very important role in trying to come up with a solution that will, will make uh, civil liberties safer and increase trust in the FBI and its administration of the program. Tell us where we are and what we might expect between now and the end of the year. I, I think you'll see language coming forward. I, I do think it needs to be reauthorized. I will tell you uh, what has happened with the FBI is unacceptable. There are going to have to be consequences for uh, any of those actions. They, 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 they simply shouldn't have 6,000 people that are authorized you know, to carry out those searches, and, and I don't think they will in the end. So uh, we, need to be able, we need to be able to protect Americans, and, and when we have somebody – that we catch, you know, if we catch a terrorist and, and they've been in touch with somebody inside the United States, and I'm talking about when we catch them overseas, we, we need to know who those people inside the United States are that they're communicating with. And it, it's just, it, it, it's part of what we have to do for national security. And it is, it's an important part. At the same time, I can tell you we're going to have to do it in such a manner that we protect you know, the American citizens, you know, constitutional rights to privacy. Do you see consensus building around some concepts now? It seems like there, there's some, been some progress behind the scenes. Yeah, I, it could be one of the great successes, right? Yeah. I, 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 think, I think there's consensus. Um, I, 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 I think I, I'm not saying everybody's going to like the, the language, but I think that most people will understand that, we need to keep these authorities and the ability to find out who terrorists have been in communication with inside the United States. And I think that you will see us going to great lengths to protect American citizens, uh, civil liberties. Yeah, I think there would be a lot of uh, applause for that. And a good way to end the year it would be something that Republicans can build on with momentum going into 2024. Uh, uh, just as you look out, getting a smaller government, you still think uh, when people vote next November that the government will be a little smaller and the FBI's Section 702 powers will be reined in. Are those two goals you think Republicans can deliver? I, I, I think that uh, I think 702 will be reined in, but still effective. 
And I will tell you that I think that uh, we will be spending significantly less money than the Democrats intended to spend. Yeah, well, that would be a victory for the American people and something they've never seen. In 25 years, there hasn't been a reduction in government spending. So any reduction will be a pretty remarkable accomplishment and set set the path for bigger stuff in the time ahead. Well, and even if you hold it, if, if you hold it level with inflation rates at where they are, you're, you're ending up with a, you know, a five percent reduction if you if you just held it level because of because of inflation. Now I'm, I'm don't don't misunderstand what I'm saying in, in, in that we should accept that. But I, but I I mean we can we can climb ourselves out of this. We we can climb ourselves out of this. We can I think so, and I think also uh, it just sends a signal. I think Americans are just looking. They know how hard inflation's hit them, and they're you know I don't care what Joe Biden says. Americans have figured out that big government spending is what drove this inflation. They now know the correlation, and they want it to stop. And I think that's an, an amazing opportunity for Republicans to deliver the debt, the interest rates. I mean, look 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 at, look at what it's doing to them. You can't buy. I just we met. Uh, we were in uh, on the weekend. We ran into a young couple that was looking for a house. In, um, in in our neighborhood, and they're like, you know what? We just can't afford it. We, I, last year we could afford it. This year we can't because interest rates have gone up. Everybody feels the consequences. And uh, there's a moment, I think, for uh, Republicans to deliver some solutions. And I think we're right around the corner from it. Sir, it's always an honor to have you on. It's always a great conversation. You're so serious about the work you do. And I think you have so much common sense you share every time you come on this show. We're, we're really greatly appreciative of it. Thank you, John. I appreciate you. You as well, sir. Thank you so much.